if the 175,000 FC Barcelona members queued up in an orderly line night after night to massage his tired feet, cook his dinner and tuck him into bed, if they carried his golf clubs around Montaigne's hilly 18 holes, if they devoted 50% of their annual salary to him, it still wouldn't be near enough to repay the debt those who love this club owe, Johan Cruyff. These are the words of Graham Hunter, author of Barca, the making of the greatest team in the world. Johan Cruyff is many things to many people. The greatest player of all time, the greatest manager of all time, the greatest all-round football-orientated thinker of all time. To even be in the conversation for one of those is unbelievable, but to be a strong contender for all three is simply insane. In reference to the title of this video, let's get one thing out the way first. If we're talking pure numbers, Johan Cruyff is objectively not the best manager ever, nor the best player ever. There are players and managers that have achieved far more than he ever did from a goals, assists and silverware perspective. But what he did for the game extends far beyond numbers, which is why in this scenario, the greatest and the best mean two very different things. He changed the very fabric of football in ways that simply cannot be understated and need reiterating whenever possible. I originally wanted to make this a video on Johan Cruyff's influence on football as a whole, but the man did so much and affected so many that I thought it best to narrow this topic down into segments. And because I'm an agent of chaos, I thought why not start with his managerial career and circle back to his playing career at a later stage. So with that being said, why is Johan Cruyff so important to football? Yo, what's going on everyone? Hope you're all doing well. I'm Tinasha. Welcome back to the channel. We've got a special one today. One that I've been meaning to write something on for quite some time now. A man widely known as the father of modern football. With that being said, let's kick this one off starting from the end of his playing days. 13th of May 1984. Johan Cruyff retires from professional football. Calling the career that this man had incredible would be a massive understatement. Nine Eredivisie titles, one La Liga title, three European Cups, a World Cup runners-up medal in a Dutch team where he was the star man, winning the World Cup Golden Ball in the process, and of course, three Ballon d'Ors. The numbers and accolades alone are ridiculous, but they don't even come close to doing what he did on the pitch justice. He was an icon. In any case, that was that. The end of an era. But as one door closed, another opened. Throughout his playing career, he had gone about his business in ways that vastly contrasted his contemporaries, so much so that him not going into management would be akin to a crime against humanity. So, surprise surprise, one year later, he did exactly that. Before we get into his managerial endeavours, I feel we have to take a brief second to go over his personality, footballing philosophies, preferred playing styles and influences. The reason I want to get into this first is because his ideologies didn't change all too much throughout his managerial career. I mean there obviously were tweaks, but they really did just change from team to team and based on incoming and outgoing personnel. So putting this section here means we'll all be on the same page throughout this entire story. Johan Cruyff was influenced by several individuals and philosophies through throughout his footballing journey and was an extremely critical thinker in his own right. But in this video, I want to highlight one influence in particular, Rinus Michels, a former Dutch coach and also a man that managed Cruyff throughout his playing years at Ajax, Barcelona and in the Dutch national team. These two spent a lot of time with one another in the trenches. Michels was a strong proponent of total football, a fast-paced, free-flowing version of the game where outfield players are given the freedom to switch positions and roam around the pitch so long as the team maintains its tactical form, a version of football that Cruyff adopted and built upon, a proactive playstyle that sought to make the opposition stumble to adapt their gameplay to you rather than the other way around. This was done by aggressively holding possession to play the game on your own terms when you have the ball and pressing in packs with a high defensive line when dispossessed to regain control. For Cruyff, this usually manifested itself in the form of a 3-4-3. Three, three. three true attackers, two wide, one central, a screening midfielder, controlling midfielders, and mobile defenders. Because of all of the above, this style of play requires highly technically proficient players. It prioritizes talent and spatial and tactical awareness above all else, i.e. players with a high football IQ. Just keep that in mind because it'll definitely come up again later on when we talk about Cruyff's chosen personnel. But above all, he was a strong proponent of not just winning, but winning in style. 
The notion of the beautiful game was not lost on him in the slightest. Quality without results is pointless. Results without quality is boring. Many people did not view football this way at all back then. Heck, many people still don't feel that way. He was on a completely different wavelength to everyone else, which also translated to him having a strong, often contentious personality, but we'll touch on that later on. On the 6th of June 1985, just one year following his on-field retirement, Johan Cruyff went into management. And if you weren't aware before, you probably would have been able to guess that he started this chapter out at Ajax. He inherited a strong team and backbone in Ajax and immediately challenged for the league in his first season in charge, which was to be expected as Ajax were the reigning champions. He managed icons such as a young Dennis Bergkamp, Frank Rijkaard, Marco van Basten and Ronald Koeman in a 3-4-3. Uh, safe to say, it was a long day for all Dutch defenders in the 80s. Despite their obvious talent and despite the fact that Ajax scored 120 goals with a ridiculous plus 85 goal difference in a 34 game season in 1986, they lost out to PSV, a trend that persisted throughout Cruyff's time in Amsterdam. He did win the KNVB Cup twice as well as the European Cup Winners Cup with them, so this wasn't a bad tenure at all. In fact, it was likely just what he needed, a, if we're being honest, highly successful first foray into high level management. I only say this because although he is an Ajax legend, most people do not associate the lion's share of this man's managerial career with the Dutch Giants. Following these three years, he was ready to make history. In 2016, Gabriel Marcotti of ESPN FC once wrote that you can separate Boss's history into BCE before Cruyff era and CE, Cruyff era. And yes, Barca are nearly 20 years after he coached his final game for the club, still very much in the Cruyff era. He may have been onto something. In 1988, Barcelona was significantly less than a shell of what they are today. They had won two league titles in 28 years, one of which was largely thanks to a Ballon d'Or winning year from Cruyff himself. A culture of losing and offering little to no retaliation to adversity was rife. Attendance was low, they were subjected to financial crisis after financial crisis and the players were actively protesting against the upper management's running of the club. It was a mess. Regarding the management, this man in particular bore the brunt of Blaugrana frustrations, Josep Luis Núñez, the first ever elected president of FC Barcelona. He was in office between 1978 and 2000. Despite being elected, and despite being highly successful trophy-wise, many still question how he ran the club to this day. He had clear favourites when it came to players. He was also caught skimping on taxes to be paid by the club on player wages, something that ultimately resulted in the players taking a massive financial hit. In 1988, Barcelona were performing poorly on all fronts, he was taking much of the blame for it and, as you can imagine, his popularity was at an all-time low. In his darkest hours, despite reportedly falling out with the man when he first left as a player, Nunez felt compelled to turn towards Cruyff for assistance, which was probably the best decision of his entire presidency. When Cruyff arrived, he had his work cut out for him. But through ruthless trimming down of the team, eye-catching recruitment and a top-to-bottom reform of training throughout the club, he was able to breathe life into the sleeping giants. And when I say ruthless trimming, I really mean it. Take a look right here. This is the lineup for the 1988 Copa del Rey final that Barcelona won just prior to Cruyff's arrival at the club. Uh, these are all the players that were left from the squad going into the next season. All in all, 15 players in total were either sold, released, not renewed or just retired. But in their place came the likes of Ronald Koeman, Chiki Begiristein and Julio Salinas. Later, Christo Stoichkov, Mikel Laudrup and Romario were added to the mix too. The team was looking like the stuff of dreams. A, uh, uh, dream team, if you will. <clears throat> Before we get into what the team achieved, we have to talk about what many believe to be Cruyff's crowning legacy at Barcelona, his impact on Barcelona's youth academy, La Masia. 
According to several sources, it appears that Cruyff was actually amongst the first to suggest the creation of the La Masia housing compound to Nunez in 1979 before his departure as a player. He suggested a similar program to the systems that were in place at Ajax. Ten years later, Cruyff returned and he had some changes in mind. He was a staunch believer in education for youth outside of football to form well-rounded people as opposed to just good football players. This is something evidenced by the various Johan Cruyff founded educational institutions that exist today that offer high quality education to current and former athletes. He had a knack for prioritizing talents over physical capabilities. Many players in youth academies at the time and even to this day are regularly axed due to their size. And at Barcelona it was no different as they were known for preemptively rejecting players that were not physically dominant or whom they did not feel would reach one 1.8 meters in height. This change in philosophy was particularly significant for none other than Pep Guardiola, who Johan Cruyff believes would not have even been given a chance at Barca had it not been for his intervention. Barca wanted to get rid of him. They considered him scrawny, bad defensively and ineffective in the air. What nobody saw was that he had the basic qualities to go far. He had game intelligence, speed in his execution, technique. If I hadn't been at Barcelona, for sure he would have been sold to a Segunda Division club. Cruyff also championed the uniformity of training methodologies throughout all levels of the club. Each team, from the youngest La Masia age group right through to the first team, trained in a similar fashion. Rondos or piggy in the middle, 3-4-3 formations, total football ideologies, uniformity, top to bottom. This allowed for seamless transitions between the teams and coaches year on year. It also allowed for young players that were good enough to be easily fast-tracked through the divisions if necessary, rapidly accelerating their development. Now, to some people, all of these ideologies may sound basic in today's terms, but just imagine them in motion almost three decades ago. This was, this was groundbreaking. And even further to that, just think of the kind of guy that it takes to affect this kind of change. Everybody knows about football, but you need the charisma to say, you must go in that way, and everybody follows. That's so difficult to find. The words of Guardiola. With all of these systems in place, success for Blagrana was just about inevitable. And almost immediately, that suspicion was vindicated. The second Cup Winners' Cup of his managerial career and a Copa del Rey in his first two years as Barcelona manager. A good start, but I don't think many people were ready for what would come next. The 1990-91 season was a special season. Real Madrid had won the league for five seasons in a row by this point, but Barcelona and Cruyff made sure that their time was up. They lifted the league trophy this year, and by 1994, they had lifted the trophy four times in four years, the same number of times that they did it over the 31 years prior to 1990. They won a crap ton under Cruyff and were an absolute menace to not only the league but also the continent. And speaking of which, the crown jewel of Cruyff's dream team tenure was surely the 1992 European Cup, the first ever European Cup triumph in the history of Barcelona Football Club, which is a crazy thing to think about knowing what the club has become since. Playing in his preferred 3-4-3 for large portions of his time as manager, Cruyff got the best out of a group of already in insanely talented players with sublime tactical acumen. And the cherry on top of the cake? Pep Guardiola and Albert Ferrer, two of the first crop of La Masia candidates to graduate, started in the European Cup final triumph and were there every step of the way throughout this period of insane success. And they certainly weren't the last to come off of Barcelona's talent conveyor belt. For Barcelona fans and everyone associated with the club, this period truly was a dream come true. Having said all of the above, like all great things, this too had to come to an end. Cruyff spent eight years as Barcelona manager and as a result of that was the longest serving manager in the club's history. That is still the case. But his final two years, 95 and 96, were a stark contrast to the first six. Barcelona were on top. But unfortunately, they were getting too comfortable. They barely won their fourth title, only thanks to a poor performance by Deportivo La Coruña in their final game of the season where a missed penalty denied them the title. They made it to the Champions League final in 1994, setting up a showdown with AC Milan. However, Cruyff displayed something that would come back to bite him almost immediately. 
Hubris. Barca are the favourites. We are more complete, competitive and experienced than them. Milan are nothing out of this world. Barcelona lost by four goals to nil. And this was pretty much the beginning of the end. Barcelona went trophyless for the next two seasons and Cruyff began to fall out with the players and with the president. Actually, that last one isn't necessarily true. He was never chummy with the president. It was always a marriage of convenience. But by 1996, him and Nunez reached their breaking points and he was shown the door. I've only touched on this slightly and while he was undeniably a footballing genius, uh, by most accounts, Johan Cruyff was a very disagreeable personality. He was an arrogant man. He knew he was good and was not afraid to let people know it. He rarely had pleasing words for the media in interviews. He was a believer in the conflict model of social interaction, a belief that you get the best out of people by inciting outrage, essentially triggering a fight or flight response. He was also a very anxious man, picking up smoking from a young age to deal with it and becoming a heavy consumer in his middle ages. That was up until 1991 where the only reason he gave up was because he had to endure double bypass heart surgery. However, unfortunately, this habit likely played a large role in his untimely death on the 24th of March 2016. After a battle with lung cancer, the life of the great Johann Cruyff came to a close at 68 years of age. Salid e disfrutad. Go out and enjoy. This is what he said to his Barcelona dream team prior to them winning the 1992 European Cup. It is also a quote that happens to be engraved on Cruyff's statue outside of the Camp Nou. This video would run for hours, days, weeks if I were to go out and find every little way that he has influenced the way the game is played. But to get a gist of the situation, we don't even have to look too far. Pep Guardiola, his greatest student, is a living embodiment of Cruyff's philosophy. A La Masia graduate that managed perhaps the greatest Barcelona team of all time. A team that, among other accolades, won two Champions Leagues in three years with seven La Masia graduates starting in each of the two finals. All members of the 2010 Ballon d'Or podium were produced by La Masia. And probably the greatest player to ever live was only given the chance to play football in the first place because of the mentality, policies and philosophy that Cruyff instilled at the club. And almost every top level manager since the 90s has been influenced by this man and the systems he employed in some shape or form. And by association, so have the players that these men have coached. Ajax won the 1995 European Cup playing an updated and amended version of Total Football courtesy of Louis van Gaal. Spain won the 2008 Euros, the 2010 World Cup and the 2012 Euros in large part thanks to his contributions to Barcelona and La Masia. Arsene Wenger's unwavering resolve in believing in youth during his Arsenal days has been linked to Cruyff's ideologies by the man himself. After losing 4-0 to Barca in the Champions League group stages in 1993, Sir Alex Ferguson took heavy notes on why possession is so important in these situations. That was a big lesson for me. They showed us how important it is to possess the ball. I hadn't understood it until then. I learned how important it is to have control of the ball in European matches. He may not be with us anymore, but everywhere you look, he's there. Gracias, Johan. And there we have it. What do you guys think of Johan Cruyff and his incredible managerial career? Feel free to leave all your thoughts in the comments below. Also, if you made it this far, feel free to follow me on Twitter and Instagram, but only if you want to. I mean, I'm just happy you're here. That is all for me today. Really hope you guys enjoyed that one. Really hope you're having a good day. Cheers, and I will catch you in the next one.